Hello, and welcome to the Polish Dragon PI Show. I am your host, Steve Zimkowski, and I am the author of the Polish Dragon PI book series, which you can find at www.polishdragon.com and at amazon.com. I want to welcome you to the first episode. Um, this program is just something I'm doing for fun to share my excitement and my love of the uh, private eye genre, which I like to read about and which I write about, and I'm hoping to be able to share that with you and share some things with you from the 1940s and 50s radio shows, and I just want to have fun with this, and if you're interested in commenting or sending any thoughts, uh, you can reach me at zimco888 at gmail.com. And what the show is all about is just sharing with, with you my thoughts about the private eye genre. Um, this is all for fun. I am in no way an expert, and I am in no way a licensed private eye, so I'm just doing this to have a little bit of fun. So just bear with me and join along if you can. Um, my favorite characters are, you know, from growing up, I used to watch TV shows like Canon, The Rockford Files, um, Magnum P.I. and things of that nature, and I grew up on that, so I always had an interest in it. Currently, I am reading The 88th Precinct by Ed McBain, which also goes by Evan Hunter, but it's not really a private eyes as much as it's a police precinct in a fictional city similar to New York City, but it takes place after World War II, so it's in the late 40s and the 1950s. Um, I enjoy those books very much. They're quick, easy reads, as are my books. I try to write them so that they're not a full-length novel. They're more like novellas, so you can pick one up and read it in a couple of hours or a day. So I'm looking forward to doing this show and having some fun doing it. Um, and, and again, if you have any questions or comments, you can just join in and, and join you know, send me any type of email that you want, the questions, but let's just keep it where we're having fun and nothing more or other than that, okay? So I'm just kind of winging it here. I'm, I'm trying to do this, so I'm not reading any type of script. Just want to have some fun. Um, so talking with my character, um, I created my character, the Polish Dragon P.I., uh, based on my childhood growing up in Slavic Village. My protagonist, Tom Sipowitz, who also grew up in Slavic Village and went to St. Stanislaus Elementary School, um, A.B. Hart Junior High School, South High School, um, and he just continued on to the military after high school, after graduating, was part of the military police force, and when he was discharged, he came back to Cleveland and joined the Cleveland Police Department where he worked his way up to detective, retiring early from the police force so that he could open his own private investigative agency, Polish Dragon Investigative Services. I gave him that nickname because as he was growing up in elementary school, he was picked on as a, by bullies and his parents sent him to one of the more premier karate schools in the city, the Karate Institute, where he learned to defend himself. Based on the time, it was a time where there was the Bruce Lee craze where everybody was looking to be the next Bruce Lee, and Bruce Lee was known as the Little Dragon. So his friends from elementary school, based on his, uh, on his Polish background, just gave him the nickname the Polish Dragon, and it stuck with him all through school and all through his military and through his career in the Cleveland Police Department. So... I just want to have some fun with this. I'm going to play you some radio shows from the 1940s and 50s so that you can experience some of the old-time private investigator shows and take it from there. And I just want to thank my sponsors for doing this for me. Um, the first one is Jay Sode Crochet, and you can follow her at J S O D E T. C R O C H E T dot com, where you can find all your crocheting needs. You can buy products from her and patterns, and she has been known to create the bolster stitch, which she created herself, and she sells patterns for that. The other one is Gino's Jewelers, 
which is located at 4701 Richmond Road in Warrensville Heights, Ohio, and the owner is Gary Coster, so you can see him for all your jewelry needs for family and friends, and just tell them that the Polish Dragon sent you. So I want to set this up for you so that, you know, we can kind of get into doing the radio shows, and the first one we're going to do is Sam Spade. Uh, Sam Spade first came onto the scene in the 1930s when the private eye genre was adopted by Americans. And he was in the book the, by Dashiell Hammett, which is called The uh, Maltese Falcon, which was made famous by, Mar uh, by Humphrey Bogart in the movie by the same name. So Sam Spade is going to be the radio shows that we're going to be listening to here for a while. And we're going to start with the first one, but let me set the scene for you so that you can kind of get in the mood. It's the late 1940s, early 1950s. You're at home, sitting in your comfortable chair. Evening has rolled around, and your favorite radio program is about to come on. The family gets together, sits down by the big radio in the corner that stands maybe four feet, five feet tall in a nice wooden case. And everybody gathers around. Dinner has been eaten already. Mom has made some popcorn, Dad has got his pipe or his cigar, and he just wants to sit back and everybody wants to relax as you go ahead and listen to the Sam Spade. This version of Sam Spade is based on, on the book, but it's also a tongue-in-cheek approach to the, um, the original character. So I hope you just sit back, take a listen, enjoy the show, send me your thoughts, and I will talk to you again next week. Thank you so very much. The Adventures of Sam Spade, Detective, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic, the non-alcoholic hair tonic that contains lanolin. Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. Sam Spade Detective Agency. Me, sweetheart. Sam, how did it go? It was the end, Effie, but the end. Oh, Sam, not another one of those society things. Depends on what you mean by society. Well, you know, Sam, cafe society. Cocktails for two, hands across the table, make it another old-fashioned, please. Let's not lose our head, Effie. Uh, nothing but double martinis, very dry, with two olives, sweetheart. Two olives? Mm -hmm. Oh, Sam, isn't that overdoing it? It was all overdone, sweetheart. That's what cranked it. Now, stay right where you are. I'll be right down to mix up my report on the dry martini caper, get it? Dashiell Hammett, America's leading detective fiction writer and creator of Sam Spade, the hard-boiled private eye, and William Spear, radio's outstanding producer-director of mystery and crime drama, join their talent to make your hair stand on end with the adventures of Sam Spade. Presented by the makers of Wild Root Cream Oil for the hair. August is always a great vacation month. And for those of you planning to take your vacation soon, let me suggest that when you're packing, be sure you include a bottle and a handy tube of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. For no matter where you go, you can always depend on Wild Root Cream Oil to groom your hair neatly and naturally, relieve dryness, and remove loose dandruff. Yes, you can take it with you on your vacation, and you should. Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. And now, with Howard Duff starring as Spade, Wild Root brings to the air the greatest private detective of them all in The Adventures of Sam Spade. Sam, you look sober as an owl. Wise as an owl, sober as a judge, Ed. Oh. Well, the way you talked on the phone, I thought you drowned the shamrock, kissed Ooh. the black Betty, spliced the main brace, decorated the mahogany, made a Dutch bargain, or, in a word, gone to give a Chinaman a music lesson. Effie, I wish you'd spend more time with Harper's Bazaar while I'm gone, and less with the thesaurus of slang. Ah. Uh -huh. Didn't know I could say that. Are you sober? Well, I've been riding the choo-choo, drinking Adam Bale, and if you don't believe it, just ask me to walk for Chuck. Okay, here's your dozy. Arms akimbo, eyes blazed. Yes, sir. Now then, uh, tip of the forefinger to the tip of the nose. Oh. Oh, Sam, it makes me dizzy. Dizzy Gillespie? Dizzy Gillespie. Oh, Sam. Exactly. And uh, you are not sewn up, shagged, shellacked, shickered, stuckered, tap-shackled, stiffo, or real crazy. Well, you know best. 
Sam. Good. Now try this one. Yes, Fred. Uh, sitting posture. Limbs cruciform. What? Cheesecake stop. Oh, Sam. That's it. Now place the notebook. Uh uh-uh, Just a little higher. Good. Yes. Now apply the tip of the pencil to the top of the fool's cap and proceed. Viz. Viz. Date. August 1st, 1948. To Mrs. Netta Martini, 1000 Marina Boulevard, San Francisco. From Samuel Spade, license number 127596. Subject, Dear Netta. The first I knew of the caper was the day before yesterday morning when I saw your husband's picture in the paper. It was one of those lovingly retouched executive type photographs of a man in his late 40s or early 50s graying at the temples and wearing an embalmed man of distinction look. The story was headlined, Corporation Head Waylaid by Mysterious Assailant. Chauffeur foils would-be kidnappers at offices of Martini Trading Company. The item under it wasn't as thrilling as the headline. It sounded as if he'd been knocked down for his wallet and the attempted kidnapping had been dreamed up by a bored city news reporter. I tossed it in the wastebasket along with my morning mail and went back to the police gazette. On page three, the phone rang. <coughs> Unique Garage, Harry speaking. Mr. Spade? One moment, who's calling? Gordon Martini. Not uh, Gordon Martini, the corporation head waylaid by mysterious assailant. Chairman of the board, and there's nothing mysterious about it. Then what are you doing on this phone? I can't talk on the phone. Where are you? In a hospital? I left that pest house this morning. I'm at my residence, 1000 Marina Boulevard. Mm -hmm. It will take you exactly 20 minutes by cab. You will meet me in front of the building, and we'll have our conference in my car en route to the office. Where's your office? Downtown Post Street. Oh, why don't I meet you there? I'm a busy man. I have a full calendar. I'm already late due to all that hospital red tape. But I can fit you onto my schedule if you'll hurry. Now, look alive, man. Well, it's a little early in the morning, but I'm trying on. Good. What will you want for a retainer? I'll let you know if I decide to take the job. Fair enough. 20 minutes. I'll expect you. I uh, should have looked more alive. It took me two minutes to get out of the street, one minute to flag down a cab, and 18 minutes to reach your address letter, a total of 21 minutes. As my taxi drew up to the curb in front of the canopy entrance to the corner of Apartment House at 1000 Marina, I saw your husband pacing indignantly up and down in front of the entrance, pausing only to glare at the outsized chronometer on his left wrist. His gray Hamburg was perched atop an outsized turban of gauze bandage that decorated his head. Ah, are you spade? You're exactly one minute and uh, 22 seconds late. Hours are made of minutes, minutes are made of seconds. In killing this seemingly negligible interval of time, you have wounded an hour. Oh, I have. Well, I'm sorry. The uh, traffic's pretty heavy out here this hour of the morning, you know. You should have started a minute and 22 seconds earlier. I'm sorry there was a bore on the telephone kept talking about how valuable his time was. Yeah, well, don't apologize. Only waste more time. Now, here's your check, $100. My car's just around the corner. I pay that chauffeur a large salary. We mustn't keep him waiting. In the meantime, you may as well start earning a fee. I've been earning it for the past uh, 22 minutes and 22 seconds. Wait. Uh-huh. I suspected as much. You drive a car? Yeah, you mean uh, one man drives all that? Yeah, I see him, that rascally chauffeur of mine. Sleep in the back seat. All right, come out of there, you pay Hey, what? <laughs> behind him and a little to the right. The shock of the rapid fire, 30 caliber slugs, lifted him off his feet and knocked him against me. I went down under his 300 pounds of dead weight. By the time I rolled him off of me and got up, the gunman had jumped out of the limousine and into a gray sedan that was double parked alongside. In the water of traffic on the boulevard, I didn't dare risk throwing a shot after him, but I did get the first three numbers of the license plate before it buried itself in the heavy stream of AM commuters. That's when the air changed from exhaust fumes to something out of a Persian garden. I turned and looked for the first time into your Nile green eyes, Netta, and saw you twisting a handkerchief in your pale hands I might have loved beside the Shalimar, but on Marina Boulevard, they looked like hysterics dead ahead. Who did it? You saw him. Don't lie to me. Why don't they come with the ambulance? All those people standing around, they're staring at me. Make them go away. Make them go away. I can't stand it. Uh, Stop it, will you? That's better. Come on over here. <laughs> Who are you, his wife? Yes, and it was all my fault. This is the end. I called Ernie out the window and asked him to come upstairs. I, I wanted him to return some lingerie. They sent the wrong color, Pete. Yeah, yeah, who's Ernie? He's our chauffeur. I was looking for the exchange slip when we heard the shots. Is he dead this time? Yeah, don't go to pieces. Poor Gordon, he had so many enemies. He didn't drink well, you know. People dropped us like flies. Well, they certainly dropped your husband. Are you a policeman? No, but I'll do until the real thing comes along, which is right now. If I were you, lady, I'd uh, go back upstairs and relax. They'll get to you soon enough. Yes, I suppose you're right. 
poor Gordon. He looks so natural stretched out on the pavement. Yeah. I, I keep thinking he'll get up and stagger on into the elevator. He didn't drink at all well. Go on, will you? All right, I'm going. Oh, Ernie, where did you go? Down to the garage. I, I heard a car driving. Poor Mr. Martini. It, it's all my fault. No, Ernie, it's mine. If I only had to mislay that exchange with you. What? You know, when I called you out the window to come and get that package. Oh, oh, that. What do we got here? Who's the witness? Me. Oh, a spade. Lost another client, huh? Not quite. I haven't cashed the check yet. Well, they got him anyway. All right, put the space in there. Let him throw that statue. All right. All right. Step over here out of the crowd, Sam. I want to get this statue. Hey. Yeah. All right, step away, please. Okay, Gary, take it down. Got a pencil? Yeah, and I want it back. Let's have it. This guy is Gordon Martini. Mm -hmm. He headed up a local firm, the Martini Trading Company. Mm -hmm. Last night, he was working late at his office. Got boinged. All right. Phoned me this morning. Didn't know why. Thought maybe he wanted a bodyguard. Anyway, he needed one. Mm -hmm. Gunman was uh, crouched in the back seat of the limousine, shoved the carbine out when Martini opened the door. Carbine. Mm -hmm. Didn't get a good look at him. You can see why, the way it's closed in, no side windows. Mm -hmm. Foreign car, isn't it? Stop drooling. You can't afford one. You getting all this? What about the getaway? Martini fell on top of me. I saw the getaway car in the back of his head. Yeah. The car was a gray sedan. In the back of his head was a standard make, too. Only got the first three digits of license plate, uh, 5D9. 5D9. Anything else? Yeah, give me back my pencil. The homicide boys want some help. They know my fee. Mr. Fade. This is Martini. Why aren't you and Ernie upstairs getting your alibis shaped up? Oh, please, I, I can't face the questions just yet. Would it be legal if I just avoided them so I can collect myself? I don't know about legal, but it might be smart. Where can we talk? What do you suggest? Well, there's a little cocktail lounge up on Lombard where Ernie and I all... Uh, I mean, well, it's, it's just around the corner. Very handy. Let's go. Against my mother's advice, I should have listened. But, well, that's why I married Mr. Martini. Well, uh, that place is up to 1943, and it's only a uh, quarter of 12. You're just like him. Always holding a stopwatch over my head. Always? Well, he drank, you know. You told me that. But it's much more important than you think. He often fell down and bumped his head. You mean that mysterious assailant that waylaid him last night in his office was a double martini? Two pitchers full before dinner. Sure. And he had to carry him up to his office. Well, what did he go up there for? Oh, we had an appointment with the vice president of the firm, Mr. Nesbitt. Something had come up and he wanted Gordon to sign some papers. I don't know what. It wasn't the first time. I waited outside in the car. After Ernie had taken him upstairs, he came back to the car and we talked. Mm -hmm. Ernie has alibis upstairs, downstairs, and all around the house. Well, then when the others came out and Gordon didn't, Ernie went upstairs to see why. Others? Mr. Nesbitt and who else? Mary Callahan. Secretary? No, she's an attorney. And if you think everything was legal between those two, well... <laughs> but after all, who am I to call the oh. kettle black? Now, what are you trying to tell me? That she got him drunk so they could make him sign some papers? That he got himself drunk so he couldn't write his name? Or that he just got drunk and fell down? Between you and me, I think she pushed him down a flight of stairs. In his condition, he never remembered. Why are you putting a finger on the Callahan day? Well, what would you think? She was the last one out of the building. Why didn't you want to tell all this to the police? Well, I didn't want to talk about his drinking. Things were bad enough already. That would have been the end. Well, that's as good an answer as any. What do you want me to do for you? Prove that she did it and Ernie didn't. I'll let you take care of Ernie. Oh, no. I don't want to alibi him unless I have to. He might get the wrong idea. You mean I've got the wrong idea? He might think it meant I still care for him, and I don't. I can't stand him anymore. The way he chews those toothpicks. <coughs> and besides, if his alibi is too good, I might have trouble about that car being in the back seat of my car. Pardon me, it sounded as if you said you might have trouble about a car being in the back seat of your car. That's what I said. Where is your car? In the garage. But somebody had it out this morning. They, they scraped the fender coming back in and they ran in the wall. They must have been in an awful hurry. <laughs> Tell me, this car of yours, it wouldn't be uh, a gray sedan? Yes. License number? Oh, wait a minute. It's on my key ring. Uh, here, 5D90. That's enough. Why didn't you tell me this before? Well, I, I couldn't get up the nerve. After I heard you tell that policeman the gun that killed Gordon was a carbine and the gray sedan and all that, well, it's the end. I hoped you were right, but I didn't think so. When I went to look at the gray sedan in your garage, I knew you were wrong, dead wrong. It was the getaway car, all right, and the carbine, as you know, was proven later to be the one that killed your husband. But Ernie had turned into a very poor suspect indeed. He was hugging the carpet between the front and the rear seats, and when I nudged him, he didn't move. 
He'd been shot at closer range in Gordon Martini, and the killer had used only one slug. It was planted in the base of his brain, which made him not only a very poor suspect, but a very dead one. The makers of Wild Root Cream Oil are presenting the weekly Sunday adventure of Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, Sam Spade. If you want the well-groomed look that helps you get ahead socially and on the job, listen. Recently, thousands of people from coast to coast who bought Wild Root Cream Oil for the first time were asked, how does Wild Root Cream Oil compare with the hair tonic you previously used? Better than four out of five who replied said they preferred Wild Root Cream Oil. And no wonder. Wild Root Cream Oil grooms the hair neatly and naturally, relieves annoying dryness, and removes loose dandruff. What's more, non-alcoholic Wild Root Cream Oil is the only leading hair tonic that contains soothing lanolin. So ask for Wild Root Cream Oil Hair Tonic. Again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. By the way, smart girls use Wild Root Cream Oil, too. And mothers say it's grand for training children's hair. <laughs> Now, back to the dry martini caper. Tonight's adventure with Sam Spade. Martini Trading Company, good afternoon. I'm sorry, Mr. Nesbitt is in conference. I'll see that he gets your message. Well, what can I do for you? I, uh, would like to see Miss Callahan. Miss Callahan is in conference with Mr. Nesbitt. Good. I would like to see them both. But I have orders not to disturb them. You do not have to. I will. Just a minute. You can't go breaking in like that. Yes, and I'll tell you something else. He won't ever get away with it. Why, everyone in this town knows about your underworld connection. Why, you doddering old fool, when I get through with you, if you don't go to the gas chamber for Gordon Martini's murder, you wish you Come had. On. If I go to the gas chamber, it'll be for killing you, not Gordon. Oh, you said it. Oh, why didn't I have witnesses here? <laughs> Miss Callahan? Oh. Did you hear that? Uh, you weren't talking loud enough. I didn't hear a thing. Well, come on in here and I'll tell you a thing or two. Uh, close that door. Now, sit down. Thanks. I listen better on my feet. Oh, so you're the detective Netta Martini employed, eh? Uh, what's she paying you? That'll depend on how much I have to do for her. Well, I'll tell you how much you'll have to do for her. You'll have to make a case against me, and that's not going to be easy. Uh, why do you think she's out to get you? Why, indeed. <laughs> For years, this moth-eaten mouthpiece, this parboiled Porsche, has been victimizing poor Gordon, taking advantage of his weakness for drugs. Oh, you... Now that she's liquidated him, she appears with 55% of the common stock. <laughs> Motive enough, eh? Why, oh, uh... you fraudulent old fool! I simply bought up his debts and threw an attachment on those stocks. Unethical, but perfectly legal. Oh, look, well, uh... you're not even a proper thief. You're nothing but a bumbling old embezzler. Now, listen you here. You're here because he was going to call in the auditors to look over those books of yours. A scene of double entry, Mr. Spade. Now, look, look. Will you save this for the courtroom scene? Now, You've convinced me. You're both crooked. I'll see that you both go up for something. That's a promise. Oh, Mr. Spade, I gave you credit for better sense. Do you know that this Medusa of the magistrate's court, this harpy of the Hall of Justice, what? tricked him into changing the beneficiary of his insurance the very night she pushed him down the stairs? And you were all in favor of it when you thought you held a controlling interest in the company. Answer that. You see, Mr. Spade, he can't answer that. Oh, good, good. I'm glad one of you is temporarily lost for words. Now, I only want to know one thing, and I want a straight answer. And if either one of you starts off in another speech, I'm going to push you into the nearest cloakroom and lock you in together. Why, you wouldn't dare. Try me, sweetheart. <laughs> well, uh, what do you want to know about this Amazon ambulance chaser? This will be of the traffic court. Uh, 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 uh. Watch it. Well, what do you want to know? About Martini's insurance policy. Now, you say he changed the beneficiary. Please answer in ten words or less. Who was the beneficiary, and who is the beneficiary now? I'll have to answer that question in two parts. The beneficiary was his wife. He changed it to the Martini Trading Company, a corporation of the state of California. Thank you, and goodbye, Mary Callahan. And that nutter took the heat off of you for the time being, which made things tough for me. Because Callahan and Nesbitt were so horrible, I never wanted to see them again, even to testify against them in court. I was sure of one thing. None of you had pulled the trigger of that carbine. 
There's been a hired killer behind it, and the way he operated, taking crazy chances in broad daylight in a crowded street, told me an important thing about it. That night, I made the rounds of the joints. At a plant called the Bing Room, I found a bouncer who had tossed out a customer that run up a bill and tried to pay it with a $1,000 check. He sent me to the Atlas Hotel. The Atlas Hotel is off of 3rd Street, down near the railroad yards. Not even a flea bag. The fleas sickened and died a long time ago. They couldn't take it. And from the look of the guests sprawled out in the mission furniture of the lobby, they wouldn't be able to much longer. A half-dead room clerk came back to the land of the living long enough to mutter a room number and wave me feebly toward a flight of crummy stairs. Yeah, what do you want? You, uh, Hack Hartman? Hey. Got anything for me, huh? Yeah, I got news for you. Get back in the room. I'll tell you all about it. Yeah. Well, come on in. Drop the ship. Yeah, I'll drop it. I'll fix you. I'll cut you good. Cut you. I'll cut you. I'm glad you did that. You make it easy for me. Now, get over there. Leave me alone. Leave me alone. I'm not feeling so good. You can feel a lot worse. Who hired you to put the burn on Martini? You don't get nothing out of me. <laughs> Who gave you that check? Oh, leave me alone. <laughs> I got all night, Hack, and I feel better than you do. Now, what did you do with that check? I'll shake it if your teeth come out with it. Come on. Oh, oh, all right, all right. Stop it, stop it. I, I don't feel so good. Okay. <laughs> Where? Pocket. My shirt. Don't reach. I'll get it. It was a company check, which is what I'd expected. It was for $1,000 drawn on the Golden Gate Trust and Loan. But I wasn't expecting to find the signature on the bottom line. It was signed in a bold, firm hand, Gordon Martini. Who was the penman on this? He wrote it himself, right in front of me. What was it supposed to be for? I, he, he wanted I should knock off his brother. You get mixed up? Well, he's dead, ain't he? That's what I mean. Gordon Martini's dead. Ah, the papers got it wrong. That was his brother, his twin brother. And that other guy, that chauffeur, kept hanging around the garage so I couldn't get out. I had to, I had to burn him, too. You know what you're saying? Yeah, 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 yeah. I'm making sense. Now get out of here. I'm getting steamed. Don't let it worry. I got a nice, cool place all picked out for you. After I turned Hack over to the cops, I did what checking I could on my own at that time of night. As nearly as I could learn, Gordon Martini could never have had a brother, twin or otherwise. He was a first child, his mother died in childbirth, and his father died one month later. So I went back to the offices of the Martini Trading Company, glass-keyed my way in, and made a quick frisk of it. There I learned that the signature on the check was indeed Gordon's, but that he had closed out his account at that bank the day he wrote it. I thought about that on the way out to your apartment. Sam, I've been calling and calling, trying to reach you. I've been so worried. It's the end. This time you might be right. Fix me a drink. Well, there's nothing in the house but those prepared martinis Gordon used to drink. Is that all right? No, but fix me one anyway. Never mind the ice. It's not morning yet, but I hate myself already. Why don't you just relax and let me get it for you? I'll relax. You get the martinis. What happened? What'd you think of Mary Callahan? Isn't she the end? <laughs> She's cute. You're all cute. All of me? How nice. I put ice in anyway. It's nasty with us. It's nasty anyway. <laughs> I hope it doesn't make you fall down the way it did poor Gordon. Thanks. What? Well, what's the matter? Too dry? You open this bottle fresh? Why, yes. What's the matter? Where are they? The rest of the bottles. Oh, yeah. More of the same. Is this all your husband ever drank? Yes, gallons of it. It's a special brand. He even took it with him to bars and people's houses. He'd sit and drink them right out of the bottle like a little child. Then he'd be falling down drunk, of course. And that's how we lost so many friends. They dropped us like, like... Like flies. Yeah, it was the end. Who are you phoning? City morgue. Uh, Maxie, Sam Spade. Sammy, what can I do on you? On, uh, Martini, Maxie. Uh, they got around the autopsy yet? Yeah, they rushed him through. Got the report handy? Right in front of me. Funny thing, Sam. The doc said they should have saved themselves the trouble. He'd have been dead in a week or two without no help. What from? Brain tumor. Malignant, it says here. Any alcohol in him? None from drinking, Sammy. Uh, what about the head wounds? 
Accidental fall due to periodic fainting spells. Part of his condition. Thanks, Maxie. Hello. What is it, Sam? Was a martini poison? No, sweetheart. The martinis were colored water. Why, they couldn't. Well, what made him get so drunk? He didn't. He was sick. But, Sam, who killed him? He killed but, himself. But he couldn't have. He hired a gunman to do it. He planned his own murder. What's that? What? Well, well, why didn't he leave a note or something? He could have ruined us all. Come here, sweetheart. Put your little hand on Uncle Sam's shoulder. What, Sam? That's, oh. uh, just what he wanted you to do. He wanted to ruin you. He let Mary Callahan fleece him out of his interest in the company. He let Nesbitt juggle the books. He let you go your way with Ernie. He let all three of you fix yourselves up with as nice a set of motives for murder as a jury could ask oh, for. Oh, couldn't have. The real joker was the check he used to pay off the man he hired to kill him. It bounced. It also proved he'd planned his own murder. But he still has his revenge. Because the insurance that would have kept the corporation from going broke won't be paid off on account of the self-liquidating cause. Oh, Sam, darling, what's going to become of us all? Well, uh, Callahan and Nesbitt will probably sue each other to death. You might have to go to work and earn a living. Well, I have $500. I might invest it in something. You already have. Here's my bill. But, Sam, you didn't help me. What? This is the end. No, it isn't, sweetheart. This is the beginning. Come here. <laughs> Period, uh, end of the end. Well, you ask me, you helped us. No, F. Well, that just goes to show you. Show what, F? Man's ingratitude to man. Hmm? But what did Mr. Martini have against you? Why, uh, nothing, sweetheart. He, uh, just needed a smart operator like, uh, well, no, Johnny Madero was under... Sam. Hmm? Have you cashed that check Mr. Martini gave you? Well, uh... Not yet, oh, I, uh... Sam, any bartender would know better than to take a check from a man who, who drinks that much? F, you haven't been paying attention. He didn't drink. He didn't. I was able to establish that later on. Well, you haven't at been the listening. time, Sam, for all anybody knew, he was a hopeless drunk. He was, Sam. Oh, you're so wonderful and trusting. But I do wish that you'd understand this. He was a hopeless drunk. For the last time, Effie, he didn't really drink. I'll just type this up, Sam, while you call the bank. I'll do that. A final reminder, friends. Whether you're going on a long vacation trip or just a weekend to the beach, be sure you've got a bottle and tube of Wild Root Cream Oil tucked away in your suitcase. Do this, and you'll find it's easy and quick to spruce up again after stepping out of the water or off the tennis court. For no matter where or when you use it, Wild Root Cream Oil grooms your hair neatly and naturally, relieves dryness, removes loose dandruff. So at home and away from home, help yourself to handsome hair with Wild Root Cream Oil. And next time you have a chance, ask your barber for a professional application of Wild Root Cream Oil hair tonic. Again and again... The choice of men who put good grooming first. Well, here it is, Sam. I hope it was worth the price of the paper and carbon. You made carbon copies of that? An unimportant report like that? Oh, it bounced? Well, the estate isn't settled yet. Oh, Sam, you're so wonderful and trusting. Effie, I am not wonderful and trusting. I am a hard-boiled private eye. I know. Just a pity there's no money in it. And I'm also too fisted. Sam. Hmm? Have you ever thought of ceramics? Of what? Ceramics. It takes virtually no capital. All you need is a small furnace and some clay. And if you don't have any talent, you can you can just make ashtrays. Thanks, I already have one. Oh, flower pots are you can pop them on a wheel. And you can pot your hat on and wheel on out of here and also take your furnace and play. <laughs> <laughs> oh, I love you when you're so gay and carefree. I am not gay and carefree. I you am You are a, a hard-boiled private eye. <laughs> Good night and sue me for your back salary, sweetheart. <laughs> Adventures of Sam Spade, Dashiell Hammett's famous private detective, are produced and directed by William Spear. 
Sam Spade is played by Howard Dove. Lorene Tuttle is Effie. The Adventures of Sam Spade are written for radio by Bob Tallman and Gil Dowd, with musical direction by Lud Gluskin. Gil Dowd directed tonight's broadcast in William Spears' absence. Join us again next Sunday for another adventure with Sam Spade, brought to you by Wild Root Cream Oil, again and again, the choice of men who put good grooming first. This is Dick Joy reminding you to... Get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. It keeps your hair in trim. You see, it's non-alcoholic, Charlie. It's made with pseudo-anilin. You better get Wild Root Cream Oil, Charlie. Start using it today. You'll find that you will have a tough time, Charlie. Keep all the gals away. Hiya, Baldy. Get Wild Root right away. This is CBS, the Columbia Broadcasting System.